like the little Aussie hat. Okie pokey weirdos. The wonderfully lustful sinners that you are. I'm Rev. And welcome to my world of cosplay shenaniganery. I have already shown you how I made my Fizzarelli cosplay. And now it is time to sin again. Are you ready to make our fuzziest lord and savior, Osmodius? Keep in mind that I've already made two of these fursuit heads as commissions, and any other explanation of how I do my commission build videos slightly differently from my other videos of my personal projects will be explained in my Roxanne Wolf cosplay video. The main difference with Osmodius is that I'm actually planning to make his fursuit head for myself eventually, so I have spread out some of the speed build videos between my personal channel and Costume Creative Studios. I likely won't be making my personal Osmodius fursuit head within the next year because life, but I do want to put LEDs into my fursuit head. So once I get to building my own, that will be the update video that y'all will get. So if you want to keep up with projects that I am currently working on, you can follow along and see my daily updates on Ko-fi and Patreon. Now we can't really go from head to toe, but I have broken the process up into much smaller sections, so we'll go bit by bit. Step one, the fursuit bucket head. I know most fursuit makers these days don't make bucket heads too much anymore. Normally they're going for these slimmer versions that either require a 3D printer or so that you use as little foam as possible. The 3D printing especially helps with using less material and having less weight to the face. The problem was with me knowing Osmodius was going to be a nearly 30 pound fursuit head, I felt a lot better about having a beefier understructure. That way it would hold itself together much more easily because I didn't want the fursuit head to collapse in on itself from its own weight and crush my client's head. To make the pattern for my bucket head base, I wrapped my mannequin head in plastic and duct tape, then marked out where all the cuts and splits and openings would be, and then I only needed half of that when I cut it away from the mannequin head because I could mirror the other side. Sadly, I did not calculate for the density of the foam when I made this pattern, so I had two halves that were each a half inch thick, meaning that I was about one inch off from the inner circumference of the bucket head base being the right circumference. Therefore, mental note for myself, I need to remember to expand the pattern and put one inch borders all the way around the pattern. Next, I wrap the mannequin head in plastic again and then put a bella quava over it to make the lining for the head. Now my personal preference for making linings for the inside of heads these days is to make a tape pattern on the inside of the head, then cut that out and put it down on fabric, cut the fabric out, sew the fabric together, and then glue it inside the head so that you get a proper fit, it's more comfortable, and the fabric that I would be using is swim fabric, which is usually moisture wicking and much more comfortable to wear. The tape pattern and then sewing a lining that specifically fits to that exact head also means less mess because I struggled with this Bella Quava so hard. The plastic I used to wrap the head was actually really cheap and thin and when hot gluing the foam to the Bella Quava, it caused some of the plastic to melt to it, leading me to have to properly line it later on anyway. I also used really thin packaging foam to help smooth out some of the rougher edges on the inside of the head before relining the head. Another note to self, remember to use heat resistant plastic if I am planning to use heat anywhere near it. <laughs> then for the excess fabric that was showing around the eyes and mouth, I cut those chunks into wedges and hot glued them away from the vision and breathing holes. Because the eye and mouth buckram were going to be a lighter color, I got really worried about the black fabric showing easily through that buckram. So I hot glued down lime green fabric to cover this up. Turned out to be a superfluous step, but it did make me feel better to do so for this first round of making the head when I was trying to figure out what I was doing. 
By the second head, I double checked to see if the black really showed through the buckram a whole lot and it did not, so unnecessary step, but made me feel better in that moment. Water in between each step, so I remember to drink water because I did not do that very well last time. Step two, designing the head base that's the actual structure that'll be attached to the bucket head. For this step, I started out by sketching everything. I traced out the shape of the bucket head on a decently sized piece of butcher paper and then sketched out the shape of Ozzy's face, especially the shape of his cheek floof. And when I was trying to figure out what expression he should have, I went ahead and checked with my client because his face is so expressive, I needed to know which expression they would prefer on their suit. And yes, I collected a lot of reference photos for this project, so you will consistently see me use my iPad over and over again to see what this thing needs to look like. With all the sketchy pencil lines down, I used a marker to map out exactly which lines I was going to be following and cut that shape out of the butcher paper. After a final test fit to the bucket head, then I knew that the face would fit and I could move on to sketching out the mane. I got a massively large piece of butcher paper, sketched out the shape of the bucket head again, and then fiddled and sketched and scribbled again and again. This is actually way too big for an average sized human. So this is proportionally correct to the cartoon and now I'm going to bring the lines in closer to the head so that it is not unbelievably massive and makes it difficult to get your way through doors. Alright. Until I finally got a shape that I wanted for his mane. It took a lot of trial and error because it was hard to find a mane shape that would easily fit through doorways, but would also look a little more proportional to the reference images. Before moving on to those adorable purple demon faces, I checked with my client about which version of the hairdo that they wanted at the top. I had two different versions of the swoosh and I personally couldn't decide which one I liked better. The demon faces themselves took a lot of fiddling too because it was hard to decide what placement would properly allow them to be seen from around Ozzy's cheek floof, but also not so far off to the edge that it was disproportionate to the reference images. And yes, on my Etsy shop, I do have patterns for this specific face, this specific mane and the demon faces. They are simple outlines, so they're nothing fancy, but for those who don't wanna start this project from scratch, I would hope that they could be helpful. Linked below. Time for step three, cutting out the foam. Look at this foam. They folded it. All I'm saying is don't fold the maps, roll the maps. And then all this plastic, they're wasting a whole bunch of plastic and a teeny tiny folded up piece of half inch foam. Not cool. I took each paper sketch, traced it out onto foam, and cut it out. Seems simple enough, and then you realize how time consuming this process actually is. The face itself was a little bit easier because I only had to cut out one piece of half inch foam for this part. The mane, however, was made up of two pieces of one inch thick foam. For me to be able to use up some of my larger scraps, one piece of the mane I cut up into three sections and then cut the other piece of the mane all in one piece. Thus, the single layer helped the piece that was all puzzled together hold its shape. Then I slowly shaved down the border of the whole mane so that when curving around to the other side, that transition would seem a little more seamless. Then I figured out that the mane was still a little too wide, so I did cut off another inch from around the border so that it could fit through doorways. Finally, I could hot glue down the two pieces together, but only around the border. For his hairdo, I cut out two layers because I wanted a more sturdy structure for this thing. Also, there are two sections because I wanted to turn it into a storage pocket. And then I added Velcro to the bottom. Due to this thing being so big, I wanted it to have multiple functions. And with the mane being the biggest part and you wanting it to remain flat, I thought it would be a pretty good idea to use it as something 
to hold and keep flat your paper goodies. Because I know a lot of convention goers go to the dealer's room and pick up signed posters and people's artwork, but then they're worried about keeping it safe. So slipping it inside the main keeps it protected. And then Ozzy can have more than the single use of a costume, but also be used as like a purse, I guess. And then Ozzy isn't just taking up space when you're not wearing the costume. I also considered this pocket as a way to pack smaller pieces for costumes, as well as smaller costumes and fabric pieces that can be folded up and slipped in there easily. That way he can act like a suitcase in transport, although I would suggest only putting paper items in that pocket while wearing it because this thing gets really heavy, especially once you add the fur. Speaking of which, step four the weight distribution and understructures. For the single layer of foam that is his face, I called upon the power of shrink eating plastic to help hold open the eye and mouth shapes. Because if not addressed over time, these sections will start to sag with the weight of the costume, meaning that they need something to help hold them open. More commonly, 3D printers would be used to make border shapes, but I did not have a 3D printer at the time to help reinforce these sections, so let's get to how I did it. While I did not fully melt the shrinky dink plastic down, the hot glue does bring it in a little bit, so I did have the outline slightly larger than what the shapes actually are to give that little bit of room for the plastic to shrink down with the hot glue. How much larger the plastic shape needs to be versus what the actual foam shape is depends on the quality of shrink eating plastic as well as the heat of your hot glue gun. So it does take some experimenting to figure that one out. Personally, I glued down that plastic in layers of two to five depending on what the shape is, how much weight it'll be taking on, and the other techniques that I'm using because to avoid the sharpness of this plastic, I also encased it in EVA foam, which brings down the number of layers of plastic that I need. However, the plastic is the stronger structure, so I did definitely want at least two layers of that plastic sandwiched between the EVA foam. Next, the eyes and mouth are traced out of buckram, painted over, and my client didn't want to go through the financial requirements that come with putting LEDs in the fursuit head. So what I did was get glow-in-the-dark paint and slather that over the eyes and mouth. And that glow-in-the-dark paint was pretty dang thick, which led me to this step. I take this tool and I punch holes, which makes it way easier to see through. And here comes the rant because Fizzarelli got one and now Ozzy's gonna get one. It is time to address this short because I got various comments claiming that there are better and easier ways to set up the fursuit eye buckram, in which I can avoid doing the hole punching step. So yes, I should have used the sponge to gently pat on the yellow and green paint. This was my screw up due to my lack of knowledge at the time. I use the dry brush technique now because this was the costume that taught me that thick paint on buckram is a no-no. <laughs> There was one suggestion that I got that I haven't tried yet, and it's painting the back of the buckram black to make it easier to see through. Although I personally haven't done it yet, I've seen plenty of other fursuit makers use this and it seems to work really well. So for my next fursuit, I definitely wanna try it. And finally, for the comment that I got repeatedly on more than just this video, I got a lot of comments claiming that my hole punching technique was overly time consuming and unnecessary. My rebuttal for that is, have you tried it? I've been making fursuit heads since 2019. Not a super long time, but I've also been making costumes since 2013, 2014, depending on where you want to officially draw the line. After making a variety of costumes and a handful of fursuit heads, I found that all costumes where I need some visibility through the buckram, this technique has worked the best for me. Even when the buckram hasn't been painted and it's left plain, there are still threads, fibers, and wefts that end up being glued together and it's difficult to see through those sections. Therefore, I find it worth my time to space those sections out and apart so that all the holes are even and look uniform. This also maximizes my visibility because my eyes can more easily blur the lines that I'm seeing and see past them to the outer world. 
Go ahead and skip this step if you believe it is overly time consuming because I know most fursuit makers don't go through with this step. It's not a requirement. And my personal choice in how I make costumes doesn't have to dictate how anyone else makes theirs. In my personal experience, I have very sensitive eyes and going through with the whole punching step really helps me see a difference. Also, specifically for this costume, the thick glow-in-the-dark paint pretty much required I went through with this step, because there was no visibility until I did that. Okay, rant over. Moving on. And I need more water, because I did a rant. It is time to connect the bucket head to the mane. To start this step, I glued two nylon webbing strips down the front of the bucket head face. Once getting the bucket head glued to the mane, I added more straps to help keep them attached. I curved one strap over the top of the head and then up the height of the hairdo, then also getting either side of the face. With more surface area covered, for these attachments, it was a lot less likely that these pieces would ever come apart. I even added straps to the inside of the mane. That way the straps could be tied and looped over your shoulders and worn like backpack straps. This would distribute the weight of the fursuit head across the wearer's shoulders and back so that the whole weight of the head is not just being put on the wearer's neck. Next, I glued the actual Aussie face to the bucket head, non-existent nose first, so that the face would be properly centered. And here's my test fit of me being goofy before moving on to the rest of the interior structures. And this last interior structure was a very special design because I created it so that the hat could be easily removed because this head was already massive and it'd be easier to separate the two pieces if possible. The way I designed it was the hat would be on a stick and a partial length of the stick would be down inside the head. To keep the stick inside the head, it would have a cross or T section to hold it in. It would be able to be turned one direction, be caught on a stopper, and be able to keep the hat inside the head until it's turned again the opposite direction and pulled out. So here is the base of that structure inside the head. The T-shaped structure I first made out of plastic and wood, this was just the test structure. Then I made a square outline of foam where the distance between each parallel line, about a half a centimeter smaller, than the stick so that the stick could fit in there snugly. Small squares of foam were added as bumpers or stoppers to keep the stick from turning any further one direction or the other. As a continuation from this mechanism as well as the rest of the head and its understructure, I also built more interior stabilization by eyeballing how much I need for each side of the face as well as the top of the head using paper to sketch out that general shape and then filling in those bits roughly with upholstery foam scraps. For that little sheet of foam at the top of the head, I did leave a slit just half a centimeter shorter than the actual stick so that it could slip inside the structure that would be underneath that sheet. And I will get to the rest of this T-structure mechanism in the section for the hat. For now, step five, the fur. To pattern the fur, I wrapped my giant foam head in newspaper. And then wrapped that in duct tape. I traced out all the sections where I knew the fur would be going in different directions and also labeled all of my different puzzle pieces with letters and numbers so I knew which pieces would puzzle back together when all of this was put back into one piece. 
I drew arrows for all the different fur directions and even on the fur itself, I drew which direction the fur was going. After cutting away the duct tape, I did label pieces more because over time I was realizing that I would not be able to figure out how those pieces went back together unless I had extra labels because I needed this thing to make complete sense even when it was laying flat. Tracing time! I had to remember to flip my pieces over against the fur so that it would be traced on the correct side. Problem number one. I nearly forgot to flip this so that it'll match the right direction when I flip the fur to the furry side. I had to trace all of my letters and numbers to the fur. Then I used a box cutter to cut out all the pieces. Personally, I would normally prefer to use little bitty scissor snips to cut away the backing of the fur without cutting the fur pile itself. However, these pieces were so large and very simple that it was a lot faster to use a box cutter. Finally, time to sew together the puzzle. The mane ended up being easy enough because it was just two giant pieces of fur sewn together, giant fur pillowcase style. For the second design of the mane, I was running out of that exact teal fabric, so I found a teal fabric that was darker and I made the lighter version, the outer border. Worked really well for that flame design. The face was a little more fiddly because you had 10 plus pieces that had fur going every which direction. So it was taking a lot of clipping pieces together and double checking that the fur was going the right direction and then sewing that together, checking the fur direction of every single piece with every single step. And then I had to do the same for every 10 plus pieces that were on this thing. Finally, I could sew the purple face to the teal mane, and I reinforced this by first having a straight stitch all the way around to get it attached, and then zigzag stitched every single one of my stitches throughout this project so that it was cemented in there. The purple demon faces are up next. I re-sketched them onto their own separate pieces of paper, cut out those paper patterns, and traced them onto the purple fur. Then carefully cut out all of the eye and mouth shapes. I also cut these shapes out of the teal mane. To do this, I slipped my cutting mat inside in between the two layers of teal fur to protect the other side of the mane from slicey slicey. While I could have done this before sewing the whole piece together, with having struggled so much with the placement of the faces, I actually wanted to sew the project together and see how it fit with the foam filling it out so that I could get the faces in the right placement. Then I used teal scraps to fill in the little slots for the eyes and mouth of the purple demon faces. With these teal pieces being so teeny tiny, I had to hand sew them, so it was pretty time consuming. And I kept myself occupied while doing this by having a James Cameron marathon because Avatar Way of Water was just about to come out in theaters and I was super excited. So please enjoy these few clips. Next, I had to pillowcase the fur onto the foam. There was plenty of fiddling and fidgeting that went on with this process, and I only hot glued down the pieces once I knew they fit perfectly, because anything that wasn't fitting quite right, I had to take the whole sleeve off again, put it under the sewing machine, and then come back. Now the eyes must be uncovered from all of this hair. I pulled the hair apart and used little bitty scissor snips to unveil the eyeballs. I continued to cut away these sections in teeny tiny bits until I could see all of my yellow sections again, being extremely careful to make sure there was still enough fur to cover Ozzy's teeth. Yeah, I'm gonna call them teeth. Time for a haircut. This boy ended up being way too fluffy at first. So I went to town with those clippers so that I could get him looking more stage ready rather than he just got up out of bed. And be sure to make sure you're wearing a mask when cutting fake fur because you do not want those itty bitty plastic particles in your lungs. Also, for the neck floof, 
I made this a more practical piece as well. I cut out a simple black piece of fabric reused from a bed sheet, then cut out the purple fur in the same shape, except only ever so slightly larger. With the purple fur being slightly larger, I could ruffle it down and sew it to the black piece, flip it right sides out, and then it would give the illusion of even more fluffiness. One of my clients said that this little pouch was really helpful for carrying their phone because the mass of bricks that we carry around these days was not gonna fit in any of the pockets that they had on their costume. So with the neck floof pocket, it's directly front and center and the phone is easily concealed by all the fluffiness. Lastly, with this step, it also coincides with the interior structures because I wanted to protect the eyes and mouth from collapsing even more. I was already seeing the weight of the costume pulling them in a bit, so I did this. I got felt as close to the eye color as I could, but it was still a little too green, so I gave them a watered down bath of yellow acrylic paint using it as a fabric dye. Then hot glued little strips of shrinky dink plastic down to the center of these felt strips. I hot glued the felt strips folding over the plastic to cover the sharp edges. Then I used these sticks of felt to act as borders around the eyes and mouth. It acted as a really nice structure to hold open the seeing and breathing holes, but also it helped clean up the rough edges between what was fabric and foam. Again, a 3D printer would have made this way easier. And we are to our last step. Number six, the hat. The hat, I honestly BS'd my way through it. I cut out EVA foam that was a rectangle and then cut one side at a sharp angle so there'd be more of a cone and the base would be a lot smaller than the top. For the base of the hat or brim, I matched a piece of EVA foam to the size of the top of the head and cut it into the right shape. Then I hot glued the edges of the cone together. Yes, contact cement would have made this a lot easier if my contact cement hadn't dried out by that point. I trimmed away most rough edges on the cone, but I wasn't super worried about them because I was planning to cover this thing in more of the black recycled bed sheet. Any large gaps I filled in with wood glue. Next, I traced the top so that I could get the insert circle, shave that circle down so it would fit down inside the hat, and then I could move on to making the feathers. With wire boning that's usually used for corsetry, I was able to make the wire the stem of the feather, then cut out EVA foam strips that were two inches wide and only about a centimeter longer than the steel boning. I cut out four pieces of feather. I contact cemented the steel boning into the center and sandwiched it together between two EVA foam pieces. The excess was trimmed, these two feathers were dremeled and heat sealed. Use a mask for EVA foam particles too. Now it is painting time. Everything should have gotten an initial layer of white spray paint so that my colors would be more vibrant and so that the spray paint could help seal the foam. Did I think of this initially? No. The top of the hat got a number of layers of pink paint and then I realized that this paint simply was not thick enough to handle this project. So everything got a spray paint coat of white and I could get back to painting the color on. The hat band got pink, so did the top of the hat and one feather. The other feather was painted blue. While the paint dried, I wrapped that hat in the thrifted fabric. Excess fabric that was coming up over the edges, I cut into wedges and hot glued down inside the foam cone. I also sewed that black fabric into a pillowcase shape to perfectly fit the hat brim. Finally, to the attachment mechanism. I shaped two donuts of about three inch foam so that they could fit snugly on my wooden dowel. This would help the hat hold its structure and keep it from collapsing. And the wooden dowel is actually the center pillar for the whole structure. And with this stick, I felt like Tebow from iCarly walking around with something that looked like bagels on a stick. Next, I whittled out a little hole in the hat brim so that the wooden dowel could go through that section and connect the cone and the brim. Once sufficiently fiddled, these pieces were all hot glued together. 
top bagel, bottom bagel, brim to cone, and brim to the bottom of the dowel. Now the wooden dowel needed its little T shape on the end. So firstly, I recycled little plastic rolls from the doggy bags. I have reused these rolls so many times for various projects, things like my Mad Hatter bandolier. Firstly, I hot glued them on for an initial stick. Then I wrapped them in yarn and continued adding hot glue while I was wrapping. To use the same rule of more surface area covered, meaning less likely to be coming apart. Sadly, this did fall apart before I could finish that process, so I had to come up with a different idea. Therefore, I cut a section of the wooden dowel to be as long as those two little plastic rolls, and then used the hot glue and yarn wrapping method, but used wood glue to cement everything together before it fell apart. Again, contact cement would have been very helpful if it had not been dried out by this point. And when making the first head, I was running out of time to be able to finish the hat, so I didn't have time to run to the store and grab contact cement. Finally, I could finish painting and attach all the things. To attach the feathers, I hot glued them to either side. And then, I used the hat band to help me hold them in place. I glued one edge of the hat band down and then slowly wrapped the hat band, hot gluing all the way around. Once the hat band was glued down, then I dumped a whole bunch of hot glue down either side of the feather to trap them under this hat band and keep them really well attached. Lastly, don't forget pet hair removal. This fabric picked up the hair from the project as well as my dog very easily. So I used some masking tape to quickly remove stuff. For good measure, I added some felt loops and little hair clips so that the clips could grab onto the fur at either end of the hat brim. And now that little T-shape can be slipped inside the slit at the top of the head, turned one direction, and then locked in by the layers of fur and foam at the top of the head. To remove it, twist it back the opposite direction it was turned to insert and pull it out of that little slit. And that is how I made two Osmodius fursuit heads. Considering these were commissions, here is what the cost of materials, work hours, and shipping are. Your total. And with me wanting to make my own fursuit head with LEDs in them, that will jack up the price of materials and work hours, so I will not even bother with those numbers right now. I simply want to make it known that that definitely jacks up the price. I'm currently working on updating my Lucy Lacemaker fursuit, as well as working on any commissions that I pick up along the way, so you can follow any daily updates on my Kofi or Patreon. If you want to request a commission, it is also linked below. And you can check out any speedrun videos for commissions at Costume Creative Studios. I often make my full build costume videos through requests, so if there are any other costumes that you've seen me make that you would like to see a full build video on, you can leave a comment below or check out this video and comment on that one which costume you would like me to make a full video on next. I love all of my amazing weirdos so much and I greatly appreciate all your subs, comms, thumbs, and a ding because YouTube is so desperately trying to turn into TikTok and for those creators who make long form content like myself, it's a lot easier to keep a foothold on the platform if you do all the YouTuber -y things that I just listed. So we most definitely thank you for all of your support. Check my link tree, link below, for any other information or content. Remember that in desire we trust. And welcome to the madness.